This morning, I want to talk about the face of God. Because in that face is seen what God is really like. You know that's the best kept secret in all the world, what God is like. Our last message to the world will be to present the character of God to people, what he is like. That will make people's hearts melt. They'll love him. They want to keep his commandments. They want to do all those things. When Moses asked to see God's glory, God didn't turn around and show him his face. Instead, God proclaimed his glory. His goodness passed before Moses. His mercy, his justice. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't come by sight, but by hearing. That's where faith comes from, and hearing by the word of God. He proclaimed his character to Moses. The gospel is God's character. When we really know what God is like, the gospel is really mean, meaningful to us. It fills us with hope. And the gospel saves us. And Moses got the idea. For when he came down off the mountain, the people were pained to see his face. He'd just been in the presence of God. He'd been looking at God's backside. And his face was still shining. He never saw the face of Christ. So just the proclamation of the gospel from God to Moses was so powerful that when he came down off the mountain, the people fled from his presence. We can't look at you, Moses. Keep your distance. Hundreds of years later, 1,400 years later, the same God visited this, this planet and in the humble surroundings of a stable, the softest touch, the softest touch that he could give to us humankind. Not like a king riding in Revelation 19 on a white horse, not like that. That's how it will be at the end. But he'll have a people who will not be pained at that. But he came to us as a baby. Nobody's afraid of a baby. We had a baby here last week, right? <laughs> What a wonderful thing. You know, I'm so pleased with all the children in our church today. Yeah. This church will grow if they're children. And I don't care about the little noises that I hear. Don't care about that at all. They're learning just like we are, right? It's wonderful. Thank you for bringing children to church. When the proud Satan appears, the Bible says he will appear as an angel of light, but not Jesus. When he came here, he came with the softest touch that he could possibly give to us. Oh, we have every reason to love Jesus. He doesn't want to scare us away. He wants to attract us to himself with the cords of love. That's that where he is, there we will also be when he comes. The character of Christ is the gospel. That's what the gospel is. The love that's expressed at the cross is the gospel. He poured out his character of love and grace into the world with all of its power in a manner so that we could behold him and yet exist. He veiled his face with humanity and humility. Hebrews 10 says that that veil is his flesh. He veiled his Divinity with his flesh, our flesh, like us. The full glory, the most holy place, he veiled with our flesh. And he pitched his tent beside our tent, it says in Romans, er, in, it says in John 1, verse 14. He pitched his tent beside our tents. And his glory, his goodness was passed, has passed before us. And we see what Moses saw. When we look at the cross, we see what Moses saw. The character of God, his goodness. And one day there will only be two camps on this planet. Only two. God will show his face this time in all of its unveiled splendor and glory. And those who are not his, a part of his family, sons and daughters of God, will run for cover. We don't want to be, we don't want to be there that way, in that, that, in that day. 
You know, a few years ago, how many of you have heard of Mount St. Helens? I used to live in the Northwest. Not too far from Portland, north of Portland, a ways, there was a mountain, Mount St. Helens, and it blew its top a number of years ago. I think it was in the early 80s. I'm not really sure. Is that right? The cloud was so fast and so strong that if you were 10 miles away, you were too close. That uh, cloud of, uh, of dust and ash spread across the countryside. So in that day, when Jesus comes in the full glory of his Father, the unforgiven ones will run in every direction. How come they're unforgiven ones? You know, we have to make a decision whether we want to be forgiven or not, right? And we come to Jesus and give him, give him the, the uh, glory that is due him. The family of God, however, will stretch their hands up into the heavens and they'll say, Oh, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Two different kinds of situations here. The difference is what some have chosen in the now. We're not in the not yet, but we're in the now. And what we have chosen now will make the difference. How we have treated Jesus, how we have allowed him in as he knocks on the door of our heart. To every heart he knocks. He wants to come in. He wants to share his wonderful character with us, his goodness. It's, a, it's decision time for earth people. I see people on the streets. I go to Douglas. There's a lot of, of poverty in the city of Douglas. I see eyes that are kind of glazed over. They don't really understand what we're saying. There's a lot of drug use down there. I think there's a lot of drug use everywhere now. The battle is for our mind. He wants us to look to him and know him, but the minds are becoming clouded. I go into their homes and I see fear and discouragement and poverty and how they're going to eat another day. Many people are like that right now. We have a message for the, for the, we have a message for the gloom, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We have been bidden to, bidden to take it every house to every, to every man's door and every woman's door. You know, glory answers to glory. The redeemed will only be reflecting what they see in that day when Jesus comes. They will see him as he is. The face of Jesus. Of all the themes of the devoutly spiritual poets and artists and singers, perhaps none equals that of the face of Christ. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, perhaps the... There was, there was a song, there was no song more universally sang, sung than the one we sang this morning. The glory song. When by the gift of his infinite grace I am, accorded, I am, I am accorded in heaven a place. Amen. Just to be there and look upon his face. Will through the ages be glory for me. Hallelujah. There's a deep reason for all of this. Paul profoundly says, God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts. Now, he's reaching clear back to the creation of the world, isn't he? Let me read that again. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined into our hearts to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.16 that was part of our scripture reading this morning. Today, I want, I want us to take a long, hard look at the face of Jesus. So misunderstood, so avoided by so many. Because in that face is seen the character of God revealed in him. Paul says, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Think of it. The creative power of the creator in Genesis 1 causing the light to shine and to, to chase away the darkness, he does the same thing with us when we give ourselves to him and look full in his wonderful face. Truth, 
Truth about that glory in the face of Christ that shines in the heart of true believers is so profound, so exalted, that you have to experience it to really believe it. That inspired the apostle to reach clear back to the creation of the world as the light shines in the darkness. The world's <clears throat> were framed by the word of God. He spoke and it was he spoke and it was done, right? He commanded and it stood fast. The world at the time of the creation was surrounded by a pall of darkness. How many of you have been in a cave? <laughs> you know, in southern Oregon, uh, near the place called Cave Junction, there's a cave. Maybe some of you have been to that cave. You go deep into the heart of that cave. I took a tour one time. Uh, <clears throat> And when we were deep in the cave, they wanted us to experience what darkness was like. So they turned the lights out. And uh, you couldn't, you know, it was just, uh, <laughs> I've never experienced such total blackness. In the beginning, there was no light on the planet. As the word was spoken and the earth was called into existence, it was complete darkness. An abyss without form and void. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. You know, light always takes away the darkness, but darkness never brings light, right? The pre-lighted pre world was in the state of chaos, and darkness fitly represents the life of the sinner. <laughs> this is an object lesson for us. The way the earth was is the way we all are as we come into this world. The fall of our first parents was a total fall. The character of Satan was written on the mind. And that, that, that the character of Satan is rebellion. Paul describes such a one as having the understanding darkened, even being alienated from the life of God or the light of God or the life of God. They're interchangeable. We were aliens. Separated from the, from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers to the covenant that God had made to the human family in Genesis 3.15. Strangers to that. Having no hope without God in the world. That's how we all came to be. Like the darkness when God first created the world. While man was in this dark, deplorable condition, God looked with pity and love and grace. Sometime in your afternoon reading, you might want to read Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. God comes along and he sees this baby who is uh, laying there. He'd just been born. Navel isn't even cut. In his blood and abandoned. That was our condition. And he comes along and he sees us in that deplorable condition. And he takes water and he washes us off. Soothes our skin with oil. Now, he's really talking about the Jewish nation at this point, but that's how we all come into the world. What a loving, wonderful God he is. In his infinite wisdom, he developed a plan, a plan so profound and so perfect that even the great God could not have made a better plan. And this is what we have to share with the world. He dispelled the darkness from the sinner as he did in the pre-lighted world. The Old Testament prophet called, it, called him the son of righteousness. It's S-U-N in the Bible, the son of righteousness. In the middle of that cave, there were no trees. There were no plants. When the lights came on, I didn't see anything green. How come? <laughs> it takes the light of the sun, right? And when light comes, there's life. And the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We need to get a fresh glimpse of that face every day. How do we do that, by the way? You know, this is a Jesus book. Spend some quality time every day learning to know Jesus. That's why we study the Bible, right? To learn to know him. To know him is eternal life. So it's important that we spend some time every day looking into the face of Christ. 
Psalms 34, verse 5 says, They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. Numberless times, lost men and women have looked to the face of Christ, and their faces have been lightened, like Moses was on the mountain, and reflected something of the glory of God. Other of his saints have been in dark midnight with sorrow and persecution and loss, even in the valley of the shadow of death, martyrs in some cases. And the light shined into their hearts and gave them a vision of something much better. Oh, for a vision of Jesus. Oh, for a glimpse of his face, radiant with heavenly beauty, beaming with divine grace. That faith vision of the, faith of, of the face of Jesus has caused many to work and pray and live and sacrifice and suffer, even, un, even, even die in anticipation of the future life to come. How do we look at his face? Is this just an abstract theory that the Bible presents to us? Or is it a practical work of the Holy Spirit? I want to read again. I'd like to have you see it again uh, as we read it this time. I've quoted it, but let's look at it again. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, he's referring here to, this, to the creation of the world. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. As Jesus prayed often, the burden of his prayers was for lost people. Do you know in John 17, he's even praying for us, a whole chapter. If you look at that, you have a red letter edition, the whole chapter's red. Who's he praying for again? Us. He wants us to be in heaven. He wants us to be with him forever. And uh, he had no personal ambition to satisfy of his own. But for us, he prayed that the convicting mighty spirit of God might awaken and convict and convert people. This is what we need every day, a fresh glimpse. His face would shine with unfaced, unselfish love. It was a steadfast face. And when it came time for him to sacrifice on the cross, the Bible says he was obedient to the promise. Can you see him in the last, the last hours as he makes his way to Jerusalem with the disciples? He steadfastly, the Bible says, set his face like a flint to Jerusalem. He was a man on a mission. He was the God man on a mission. Like a flint. What does that mean? He set his face like a flint. He could not be turned. It could not be changed. The disciples never saw that look on his face before. The, the look was probably stern. He was thinking about it. And resolute and unwavering as he stood there in the very shadow of the cross. He headed for Jerusalem to carry out the divine will. And as the Bible says, it led him to Gethsemane and to Calvary, just as he promised. The Bible says in Philippians 2, he was obedient unto death. What was he obedient to? You know, he promised us, he made us a promise. God never lies to us. He promised us that he would forgive every repentant sinner. And he was obedient to that calling. When it says he was obedient to the cross, even the death of the cross, it means that he was keeping his promise. He doesn't lie to us. He never tells us those kind of things. He promised and he delivered. And those intense hours of suffering in Gethsemane, wrestling on the ground, for the victory over whose sins? Our sins, the victory over our sins, wrestling on the ground so that he could fully atone for our sins. You know, there's a text in the Old Testament, Leviticus 17, 11, it says, it is the blood, 
that makes atonement for the soul. It took blood to bring forgiveness to us and to bring hope for the future. The mighty waves of darkness rolling over him, the tears and the blood on his face. All alone he was. Even in Gethsemane, even, in, even the disciples did not understand what he was trying to do. His fingers clinched into the dirt. As blood is dropping from his forehead, he was thinking only of one thing, and that's you and me. How unselfish is the character of our God. Lord, open my eyes to behold this unselfish love and the light that comes from the face of Jesus to lighten my life. This is the pure gold. This is how pure gold is made in the furnace, tried with fire. See him there in Gethsemane, full of love, yet, fe yet feeling and experiencing all of the forces of evil and suffering that was against him. It was all for my salvation. That's what he offers me is the gold that's been tried in the fire. He paved the way for this. That gold was, was, was uh, produced in his passion for us in Gethsemane and on the cross. He offers to sell that to us, but it doesn't cost us anything. It was free. It's free to us, but it costs somebody a lot to get it for us. That's what we need to see. There's no such thing as cheap grace. <laughs> I hear that term bandied around. Some people might, might, might be kind of overlook grace a little bit, but grace costs somebody a lot. And he offers it us to us without money and without price. He has it for sale. Gold tried in the fire, the real article. And he offers me also the eye salve. This is uh, from Laodicea, right? The Laodicean message. Offers us the eye salve. Why the eye salve? What do the eyes represent in the, in the scripture? What is the symbolic? What does the eye symbol mean? Understanding. In Ephesians 1, it talks about the eyes of your what? Understanding. He wants us to understand this. He wants us to get it. Okay. Sometimes he repeats things again and again and again in the scripture. And then it's almost like he looks at us and says, do you get it now? He offers me the eye salve so that I can see the light shining from the face of Jesus so that I can have, their, that, I can have that understanding. There's light and comfort here. But he couldn't see it. Only the blood-stained dirt that he was clinching to with his fingers as he wrought out my ransom. The Bible says, the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him, and when they had blindfolded him, they struck him in the face. How come do you think that they blindfolded him when they did that? And then they taunted him about that. How can you even think about this without an inexpressible shame for the human race. That any human could treat such a benefactor that way. These were representatives of our race. We were all like that. Do you know that it was our sins that put him on the cross and put him in Gethsemane? Zechariah 3.6. Let's look at that one. That's right near the end of the Old Testament. It's Zechariah, I said 3 6, it's 13 6. Zechariah 13 6. <clears throat> One shall say to him, What are these wounds in your hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded. In the house of my what? Friends. He was wounded in the house of his friends. The Bible says he came to his own. The ones who had been given prophecies to all through the centuries. You know, in our Sabbath school class this morning, we studied about the, the great prophecy in Daniel 8 and 9. You know, the nation that was his people had those prophecies in their possession. 
And after studying these prophecies, they never found Jesus. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Could it be that we could study the prophecies and study and study and study and have it by rote, even memorizing some of it, and not find Jesus? That's a possibility, isn't it? And not be ready for him when he comes. No wonder they covered his face before they struck him. They couldn't look that noble face in the eyes while they were doing it. It would, it would have condemned them if they had. So they covered his face and they smote him, slapped him in the face. The great wonder of it all is that the purity and the majestic nobility and unselfish love of the Creator didn't shine forth from his face and smite them all. It could have done that. He could have done that, couldn't he? And all the rest of us too. If he had done that, the rest of us would be lost also. How can we look on that face, that holy face of Jesus, without experiencing an overwhelming hatred for sin? How can we do that? How can we avoid the resolution to accept the grace of God, which is poured out freely? You know, I read someplace that the grace of God is as plentiful as the air we breathe. It's all over the place. <clears throat> so that we can be armed to wage the unceasing warfare against the selfish principles of Satan's kingdom. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, where? In the heavenly places around us who are bent on our destruction. With his stripes, the Bible says, we are healed. That's all Jesus wanted out, of, wanted out of this. That's all he wanted was for our stripes to be healed. He had stripes on his back. The Roman whip was a very cruel thing. It had pieces of metal. And when the Roman uh, executioner used that whip, it went all the way to the bone. David, you know what that would be like. Lacerated all the way to the bone. With his stripes, we are healed. That's all that Jesus wanted out of this. The tokens of his humiliation are his greatest honor. There was a great evangelist by the name of Dwight L. Moody. Some of you have heard that name. An evangelist of yesteryear, he said that when Jesus ascended upon high, all he left of himself in this world was a pool of blood at the foot of the cross. Picture that. Wow. You know, for 4,000 years, earth people had looked forward to the Lamb of God to shed his precious blood. Every lamb, every, every blood, amount of blood that flowed from the lambs all through those 4,000 years, starting there right at the gates of Eden and on down to the time of the cross, all that blood looked forward to the time when God himself, can you imagine that? God himself, the creator God, would come to this world and do what he did. This is the very heart. You know, as I'm talking about this this morning, I feel like I'm on holy ground. And we all are. Because this is what God did. That's how unselfish it is. When we look full into his wonderful face, this is what we see. He was willing to do that for me. And he came down to his own, and his own didn't receive him. You know, we have more information now than they did in the 2,000 years ago. Not much excuse for us. They didn't receive him 2,000 years ago, but we have, a, we have the New Testament now added to all of that. And we know what it all means. You know, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the story. They tell the story very well. Paul comes along and tells us what it means. We have the meaning of all of this. He caused light to shine out of the darkness into our hearts so that we could believe it and make use of it. Next, to Christ's death on the cross in importance. The second greatest theme of the Bible is the second coming of Jesus. I want to just wash our eyes out with something here. 
from the Bible. It's one that we all know about. But it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. This is the next most important thing. You know, the second coming wouldn't be possible. And anybody saved in it had it not been for his coming the first time, right? Amen. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the next great event. It's still ahead of us, but not very far. I think events are all around us, realize, we realize that, that God is going to put an end to all the suffering. It's an act of mercy that, just like at the time of the flood, that God destroys the sin problem because people are suffering. Here it is, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself, who's that? Jesus. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, some of us will be alive, right? Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And then that next, next little sentence is re really something. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, how do we be ready for that event? That's the important thing for us to consider. The very next chapter tells you how to be ready for Jesus to come. Spend some time in that chapter, if you can, this week. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It tells us how to be ready for Jesus to come. If we will follow everything in that chapter, we'll be ready for Jesus to come. I'll guarantee you. Wow. I want to look at another text. Matthew 16, verse 27. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew 16, verse 27. <clears throat> Matthew 16, verse 27. It says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, then shall he reward every man according to his works. You know what the work of God is? <laughs> Do we have to scratch our fingers in the, in, the, in the in dirt like he had to? To the bone? The work of God is to believe. Let's look at it. John chapter 6, verse 29. Can you believe all this? John chapter 6, verse 29. He'll reward every man according to his works. John 6, verse 29. Here's what it says. All there. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. Paul said to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And he was baptized in his whole family. Right away. What are we waiting for? <laughs> believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Belief, if we really believe it. When, Mo, when, when Noah believed the message that God gave him, you know what he did? He spent 120 years building an ark. Arduous labor. Gopher wood. I believe it was probably the hardest wood that was available at that time. And they built an ark. 544 feet long. And the world that then was perished except for eight people. How come only eight people? They didn't believe enough to get on the ark. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul uses a little expression, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Be found in him. There's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ. Jesus is our ark. And we want to be found in him. And if we'll do that every day, give your heart to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. And spend a little bit of time learning to know him. When you know him, you'll love him. And if you love him, what will you do? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
the life that we need to go to heaven with, the character we need to go to heaven with, is supplied to us also because we have taken a long look at the face of Jesus and the character that he had and his love and compassion for all of us here. I want to read just that I'm just about done here. I want to read another passage. Another description. You know how many times the second coming of Christ is referred to in the New Testament? Over 200 times. It's a major teaching of the New Testament. One of those descriptions is in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. I want to start with verse 12, and I'll read to the end of the chapter here. Revelation chapter 6, starting with verse 12. And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth. Signs of his coming, okay? Even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she's shaken in a mighty wind, then... And, and the heaven departed as a scroll, and when it, is, as it, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and every island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens of the rocks of the mountains. They couldn't behold the face of Christ, right? It was terrible. You know what they did? They, they, they called for the caves and rocks to fall on them. Notice it says, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face. We're talking about the face of Jesus today. Hide them from that face. That's why his per persecutors and his tormentors covered his face. They couldn't look in those eyes and do what they did. And here they are now. Hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? How dreadful that I should cry for the mountains and rocks to fall on me. How dreadful that would be when somebody paid the big bill. He suffered a lot to prevent all of that. What wonderful face which was so wrongfully marred on my behalf shall appear with the full glory of heaven and take his people home. We'll see his face. We'll see him as he is. And uh, my dear friends, how awful if anyone here should miss. Is there anyone here who is not acquainted with Jesus? I don't want to see a self show of hands, but if there's anybody here who is not acquainted with Jesus, if there's just one, I'd like to pray for you in my prayer tonight, this, 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 uh, this afternoon. After the service, if somebody here would like to know Jesus better and prepare for baptism, that's the closest, most intimate contact that we can have with him to, make, to seal our, our salvation. Please come and talk to one of the elders or myself. And uh, one day soon, we shall see the king in all of his glory. <laughs>